Nice to meet all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'd like to present to you a, a group effort uh, from here in town uh, towards uh, developing, first developing a bioprinting capability that's, that's very new. Also explaining some of the challenges that have to do with bioprinting versus the kinds of printing that we have uh, seen before. And then uh, mapping this onto a problem to print to, you know, with a, uh, a medical problem in mind. And so I acknowledge a number of the uh, people who've, actually, who've done all the work. This is not you know, one main show. With network work, I'm an engineer by training. This is only possible because here in town we have a large uh, concentration of uh, ex you know, specialists in material science, biomaterials, as well as uh, surgeons, a very large density of hospitals. And I wanted to ask you, so, th so some idea of people, right? Lian Lang, who is on the left side, did a lot of the work that I'm gonna show. And now these are some idea people, and you may wonder what is Idea City, right? So what is Idea City? Do you have an idea? You know, Toronto is Idea City, right? And so we, I show you at some point during a talk uh, that we can print things like Toronto into you know, a sheet of soft material that you could potentially eat. I was thinking about bringing this machine here and eating someone's stage, but that was logistically a little bit challenging. But uh, we'll get to this uh, point. So I'll start by saying, you know, a lot of the things that we think about that we um, accommodate to uh, our flat, uh, flat nature. Uh, this is a, a copy of, the, of uh, Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, where he talks about, you know, distribution of goods. And uh, the world of printing is also flat. And the old world of printing is not just flat, it's also old. So we've heard some of the history of uh, printing. I go a little bit back. I'm not in the uh, Department of Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto. I'm in the Department of Mechanical Engineering as well as uh, Biomedical Engineering. But, you know, making substrates and then putting something onto these substrates in a sequential fashion, that's, you know, something that have, we've been doing for a long time. Manually and then using machines. And so if you look at technology now, this is what technology looks like from an engineering perspective, right? You see I'm a little bit biased. Uh, so these are massive machines that work at very high throughput. If we confine ourselves to this idea of making a substrate first and then doing something with it. And so we, when you think about tissues, uh, the idea is very similar. So we, we try to make a substrate first, then populate it with cells such that it you know, uh, uh, assumes tissue-like uh, properties. But clearly there are limitations to the sequential approach. And if we were able to combine these two steps and also gain some, some spatial control, uh, we may be able to, to, more, uh, meaningful, uh, to, to create more meaningful types of uh, uh, tissues. So what kinds of tissues am I talking about? There's abundant uh, large numbers that uh, one can get interested in. On the top left, you know, this uh, a piece of cardiac tissue. You know, that uh, makes our heart beat. Then on the, on the top right, skin. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Blood vessels on the bottom left. And then, you know, there's also leaves. Initially, I, I was very excited about leaves because we have this planar printing technology, but I couldn't find a graduate student that was ex equally, equally excited about it. Um, even though, if you could argue, the most abundant organ in Canada, right, is um, probably a leaf. Right now, there's, you know, there's no hospitals that treat leaves and, and things like that. So we we started to work on, 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 on you know things that could potentially have an impact in the clinic, of course. So two goals: uh, one is to develop a new type of printing technology that's low cost and allows us to sort of create micro uh, tissues uh, composed of human cells, recapitulating some of the physiology of, of actual tissues. And then also being able to prove that what we do can be scaled. So it can be done in a context that's ultimately clinically relevant. And you know, I'm working with uh, Mark Yeshke and Sunnybrook on some of these uh, questions, and he makes very sure that they do not forget the second part, right? Because otherwise you would, would consider what I'm doing is developing toys. So in 3D printing, you know, the, 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 there are a number of components that are very important. It's you know, having a, su a, a supply of cells that come from a patient uh, that need to be cultured, need to be expanded, needs to be a large number of cells. 
uh, a medium in which they are kept, a matrix, a biopolymer in which they feel comfortable, that has tissue-like properties, and also supplied factors that are added to the medium uh, that uh, you know, make cells behave a certain way. So for each of these fields, there's experts in, in town right here that do nothing else than studying uh, these, uh, uh, these, these particular aspects. It's very important in order to ultimately make a difference to get all these experts involved and uh, to, to come up with a meaningful solution. So then we have a bioprinted uh, type of a, um, a construct and we have to culture it. Depending on the choices that we made initially, the culture period may be shorter or longer until we get something that is close to a functional piece of tissue. And uh, so the culture period can be weeks or it can be days or it can be you know, much, much shorter. Um, so it's, it's meaningful to, to spend some time at this initial point. There are lots of strategies. So what I'm going to tell, tell you about and ultimately sh uh, very soon show, you know, some of the technology that's behind what we do has evolved from uh, ways of making computer chips. Right? All the gadgetry that we carry, I'm ha very happy to see that there's a strong focus on, on, on nerds and, and gadget makers in this, uh, in this wonderful conference. All the gadgetry that we carry uh, contains computer chips that are mass produced at really low cost. So what we do in our research and many others, uh, we sort of misuse this capability to not move around electrons, but instead create small tiny channels in also silicon or more often plastic types of materials uh, with the goal of manipulating fluids. And these fluids can contain cells and so, you know. So we can start with essentially particles that contain some cells. Uh, or we could uh, have fibers that are extruded, or we could have planar arrangements. And then we could think about building this complexity up to three dimensions. Because ultimately, if you want to make something that has a functional meaning for you know, a human, it needs to be in three dimensions, it needs to have organ scales. But there's a disconnect in a sense that doing that is very, very tedious, very, very time consuming. <laughs> And so a lot of the clinical reality um, still is with uh, decellarized, already existing uh, grafts or organs. And so what we uh, set out to do is we want to develop a platform that's compa uh, compatible with different types of matrix materials that uh, has dynamic control and is not sequential. So it starts with you know, creating some kind of microenvironment and then step by step by step building it up and then culturing a bit more so it becomes one entity, but in one step process, we create what we want to have. So one step continuous, dynamic control, high throughput, and scalable to, to three dimensions, right? So Leanne uh, Lang, who's done this work as a fearless uh, graduate student, right, and has built this machine. I show you an illustration of it. It starts with two pots. One pot is blue, the other one is red. And these, these are pots of you know, liquid biopolymers uh, that may contain some cells as payload. And so we, we organize uh, these, these are flowable uh, polymers. They are organized in this uh, uh, dashed region in a plane. So we can at will place a little bit of red within a blue sheet. And the sheet is, is moving. By the way, no mechanical indifference to the, the, a lot of the printers that you have seen and will see None of the components in this uh, strategy are moving. The only thing that's moving is the biopolymer, right? And so it's initially a, we can, we can incorporate information. We could write Toronto, right? We could write Moses, right? Uh, we could write Idea City. Uh, and then we retain this uh, organization by cross-linking, by solidifying uh, the polymer. And then we can just collect it as a sheet. And uh, that process has no end. So we can make a sheet that's infinitely long. It's just if we need a little bit more material, we keep, you know, we keep extruding. And we can roll it up, and we can do all kinds of fun things. So this is how the machine actually looks like. So the, the uh, blue part on the left side is the, you know, the piece of uh, borrowed microfabrication technology from computer makers applied to juggling fluid streams. And uh, on, the, on the right side, there's a drum that collects uh, the material or tissue that we're making. 
It's a microfabricated nozzle. You could call this a, a printer cartridge in printer language, right? As we make sheets at different uh, thickness uh, continuously. And the, uh, the thickness is a useful uh, thickness for you know, keeping cell populated, uh, you know, keeping c uh, cells in these sheets alive. So this is a, a fabricated pin printer cartridge. And there's a bunch of control that we need to uh, you know, incorporate at different uh, predefined points in time a secondary material. So now there's the machine, right? So generation one. You all can help us to build generation two. I'll get to that. Um, so that is, uh, was built last summer, Exclu uh, you know, tested a lot, uh, has been running really well. And in the center, so you see a, a liquid line that carries the biopolymer into, in the center, you know, a small uh, transparent polymer, polymer chip, the cartridge. And out of it comes a sheet of that uh, then cross-linked biopolymer that's continuous and rolled up onto a drum. So instead of doing a lot of talking, I'll just show you how this actually works. So the drum is, the drum is a rotating part, but that's not an inherent part of the printer. It's just a collection mechanism. And so we, we make continuous sheets. These sheets are a couple hundred, mi between 100 and, and, a, and a few hundred microns in thickness. Uh, we can write text into these sheets if you wanted to. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. And they're infinite in length, and it can be cell populated, and they can come at a very high throughput, uh, up to a centimeter per second. The width of these sheets can be up to three centimeters. So you can make a lot of material. Right? So we had developed this technology, and then we started incorporating information like, uh, you know, writing Toronto and. Uh, writing Toronto in binary code, you know, that's sort of what geeks do. And then we wanted to get this protected, and we talked to, you know, commercialization people, experts at the University of Toronto, and they told me, Axel, you know, that's not an application, right? So then I said, then I thought, okay, let's prove this is a robust technology, let's write more, more text. So we wrote the first article of the first chapter of the UN Charter in binary code, uh, which is, uh, you know, 80 centimeter, 90 centimeter long, all, all edible, right? And uh, but still, you know, that's you know, it's, I was told it's not an application, and so um, we thought about putting this to some good use. So we started incorporating cells. These are this work that's done in collaboration with uh, Professor uh, Melissa Radisic at, in the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. She's an expert in culturing heart cells. So we put heart cells, primary cells, into the sheets, and they uh, they're living, right? So we can incorporate them. We show that, they're, they're, that they have good viability uh, throughout these sheets. And uh, that's, that's, that's one of the properties that's very important if you want to make uh, tissue. And then we could, uh, remembering the first aim, right, then we can co-localize different cell types and also keep record of what combination we used so we could take advantage of this uh, high degree of control and then just culture these sheets, and we see that they behave as they would behave, as they, as they are expected to behave, but, uh, and assume uh, tissue-like properties. So cells connect to each other, connect to a matrix, and so this is something that, that, that ha can be useful. Cell viability is very good over up to two weeks and longer, if one cultures longer. One can also then make sheets that have uh, properties, different properties in different directions, right? So it can be stripes of green and red, and green can be a different material than red. For instance, could be, green can be stiffer than red, or you know, green can have a different taste than red, right? So whatever you want to do. So you can, you can program uh, the properties of, of these materials, right? Depending on whether you're a chef, or whether you, you know, what kind of problem you want to solve. So you can tune uh, stiffnesses uh, in, by, by, by using such means. And then, uh, we can stack these uh, sheets up. You may have noticed that I'm talking about sheets for a long time, even though we're talking about 3D. So one of the comments, or one of the first realizations has to do with, in the context of biology, the definition between, or the disting distinction between two-dimensional and three-dimensional comes from a perspective of biological cell, which was at the beginning a bit of a disappointment, but 
A biological cell is about 5 to 10 microns in size, so making a sh incorporating it controllably in a sheet that's 100 microns plus is already considered a three-dimensional environment. But now we can, we can stack these sheets up, and we can roll them, so we can make sort of tissue duct tape, if you will, if you will right? It's not available yet at uh, Canadian Tire, I, I've checked, but at some point you could you know, have duct tape to fix your blood vessels, uh, it could be a perfusible, and we can make tube, uh, tube, tubular structures that look like they want to become blood vessels. They're not yet uh, blood vessels at this stage, right? Well, it's very high throughput, so we can make these tubular assemblies. At that time, we did it manually. And I have another uh, a gift that uh, a graduate student, Ariana, and she's now taking this to the next level. She can actually extrude intact tubes at very, very high speeds, and these, in the future, we we use the same you know, uh, matrix material, so we're very sure that we can also uh, do the same things that we've done with sheets and populate these, uh, these tubes with cells. So what Moses was alluding to, and so I, can, you know, I show a little bit, I need to limit myself a bit because of limits of time, also because of an academic environment, we, we try to publish first, right? And then we present. So uh, uh, we, we are working with the uh, uh, burn center, largest burn center in Canada, in Sunnybrook. And uh, this is uh, Professor Yeshka's uh, lab, who's running this place, has a large research laboratory. And so we're now creating sheets, continuous sheets that contain human cells. And these are human fibroblasts. And that have immediately, not after some culture period only, they have immediately um, the mechanical prop uh, properties that, are, uh, that ma make them handleable as, as grafts. And so they can be cultured in vitro. We have some early stage in vivo data that I'm, uh, I don't want to show at this uh, early stage. So you have to you know, invite me or maybe Mark back to give an update on this, right? We're very excited about this because uh, the scalability of this technology, the high throughput that this technique offers, being able to cover one square meter of uh, you know, sheet-like, skin-like material within something like 45 minutes is really unmet by, by any other bioprinting technology uh, so far. All right, so what I wanted to end with is, uh, you know, I hope I have convinced you we have a, a very potent, very cool bioprinting technology made in Canada and Toronto uh, here that offers continuous formation of, of uh, you know, tissue. And uh, we have spatial control. The first generation system has been built, it's not very expensive. It's always difficult to believe the numbers of an academic, but you know, I would put a price tag there of $1,000. We've built uh, three so far, and it takes up to 45 minutes to, uh, to create, uh, to cover 40, uh, one square meter of area, which the application that we're interested in is severe burns. So, you know, that would, uh, it would be corresponding to someone who has a 40% uh, burn um, on an average meal. A second generation printer will be available in fall, right? Much cooler, even cooler. Uh, these are all the individuals there, a little bit shifted um, for formatting reasons. Uh, we have a, a, a very creative bunch of students uh, for, and, and research associate, uh, associates all the way from engineering uh, to, to cell biology, stem cell biology disciplines. Uh, Lian Lang and Saeed, Ariana. Boyang and Phoenix have done lots of the work. Mark is the surgeon, and Melissa is the biomaterials expert. And so if you want to support us, there's something we don't ask for money, and of course not. So we, there's one thing you can do. Uh, we'll apply for a, a grand challenges uh, round this summer in July, end of July. And there's going to be a very cool video. And the only thing you have to do is you click this video, and what we're going to do is build a scalable uh, next-generation bioprinter uh, with the burn unit in, in Sunnybrook, as well as a children's uh, hospital in Cambodia uh, that we think uh, will help uh, revolutionize, and I actually you know, believe in this term, revolutionize uh, burn care um, ultimately. So with that, I close, and I thank you uh, very much for the invitation and for the opportunity. <laughs>